Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If tonight we were reading the Jerusalem Herald Tribune, a fictitious news agency from 2,000 years ago, instead of the Gospel according to Luke, the news would be the same. A huge stone was moved, an empty burial vault, frightened women, petrified men in hiding, Smug Roman authorities naively believing that a rabble-rousing rabbi had been silenced for good. Though he had made, they made sure he was dead, his body was nowhere to be found. These early pictures of beginning Christianity are in sharp contrast with our experiences of being followers of Jesus tonight. We are gathered as members of the largest religion in the world. Hundreds of thousands of churches, cathedrals, home churches, informal gatherings, study groups, conferences will be gathered tonight and tomorrow to ponder anew what this bleak news story means. Those early events have caught the minds and hearts of people like you and me and prompted us to take a chance on following the one who lived through them and is alive today. Although we are part of a worldwide fellowship, each of us is engaged in finding the meaning of that empty tomb. What is there about this Jesus that fascinates us, that moves us to follow his teachings and example? What was he about that we are moved to continue? I believe it is this. He recognized that our relationship to God and to each other is primary. Jesus spent his life building relationships and lowering walls. To do this, Jesus had two remarkable qualities, the courage to be vulnerable and the courage to be inclusive. We all know this. Building a relationship is hard work. We are never carbon copies of each other. Every single person is a unique individual. Of the millions and millions of people on the earth, no two are identical. Often our differences are very evident. Language, skin color, dress, background, sexual orientation, and interests. In building relationships, our challenge is to find what we have in common. That calls us to be vulnerable. That is very, very scary for most of us. Jesus was able to relate to the outcasts of his day, the lepers, the outcasts of society, the beggars. Jesus was extraordinarily open and vulnerable to others. When AIDS was discovered here in the United States, there was widespread fear and walls went up all over the place. AIDS was believed to be a fresh death sentence for anyone having it or anyone coming into contact with it. Every medical advance, every scientific breakthrough that came about because someone dared to be vulnerable in seeking a solution. Jesus was especially open to those who were sick and suffering. The Gospels are full of stories of his healings of those who were suffering the many maladies of mankind. So too should we also. We need to remember that everyone is wounded Everyone has issues that cause them pain. Everyone needs a caring, healing touch from time to time. Here is a beautiful quote from Brother Nicholas Bartoli, the Father Koshi sent to part of us as a daily meditation. Quote, Imagine for a moment turning towards someone nearby, perhaps someone you don't know. Maybe just for a moment, you gently look upon them as the gloriously wounded humans they are. Maybe you glimpse the holes in their hands, their feet, their side. Maybe you lean a little closer, touching their wounds, and in doing so, let your own wounds be touched. Then you whisper to your fellow traveler in Christ, I'm sorry, I am so very sorry, I just didn't know but I am here for you now. That's building a relationship out of vulnerability. Our culture and our society is filled with hurting people, even our young people. 
Studies of the many mass shootings of schools and nightclubs has uncovered that 90% of the shooters, especially school shooters, young kids, experienced a significant and deep loss in their lives and were probably deeply depressed. It had been assumed that bullying was the major dynamic at work in these young shooters, but that is not the case. Loneliness, depression, rank high as probable causes for those deadly and behaviors. We need to notice the wounded in our society and share their pain. Loneliness in particular is toxic. Lonely people die earlier than those with good relationships. Building deep, nurturing relationships is not a luxury and can become a matter of life and death. Relationships can only exist when we learn to become more and more open to each other. There is another reality we have in being vulnerable that Jesus did not have face to face, at least not in the same way that we do. There's no charge for this part of the sermon, by the way. Recently, investigators reported have discovered that our postings on social media, like Twitter and Facebook, carry a high level of risk. It is becoming clear that our political positions, our internet purchases, our values, our sensitivities, through the use of algorithms, are being harvested by others for profit, on the one hand, or to manipulate public opinion on the other. It is timely to heal the biblical principle, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to become aware of our internet presence is being used for someone else's benefit or detriment. Not only did Jesus himself highly, was highly vulnerable to others, his caring was all inclusive. He never turned anyone away. His understanding that God's love was to be extended to everyone is most evident in his rewriting of the Jewish law. He upended common Jewish understanding to affirm that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and we are to love, for heaven's sakes, our enemies. Scandalous, unorthodox, and a hated point of view that God would love those who are not the chosen. Let's go right to today. This past week, we have been witness to a marvelous scientific achievement and a model process for accomplishing it. I am referring to what is known as the Event Horizon Telescope. Pictures of the immense black hole, 600 million light years away. 200 plus people from 60 countries work together to accomplish what no country could do alone. This is a watershed achievement and a clear, bold example of how to accomplish it. Shepard Noelman, the project director, noted this dynamic. 200 people from 60 countries, quote, effortlessly sidestepped the issues that divide us. Note the word effortlessly. These people lead their priorities right, got them right. Each separate country looked into the heavens and shared what they saw with every other country. Let's apply this insight to Christianity and the church, that wonderful and sacred mystery which we were reminded of in yesterday's Good Friday service. What an achievement for humanity it would be if all the Catholic branches of the church, all 22,190 Protestant denominations, all groups that declare independence from one another over the issue of how much or what kind of water to be used in baptism, if we could humbly look into the heavens and faithfully report to each other what we see. If we would effortlessly sidestep the issues that divide us and describe what we see in common, a new day for the religion and civilization would come. I believe at the heart of history is a unique human being who struggled to define his relationship to God remained open to input from others and was moved by human suffering and accepted his mission to share God's patient, unconditional love for the human race. 
We know him and call him by Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Redeemer, the Son of God. We have been moved to come together tonight to once again look at the world and each other through his eyes and heart. Every tomb we have ever created to hold him is empty. Every religious formula constructed to control him is found wanting. We know he lives, for he lives in our hearts.